I stand with Palestinians, very clearly, unapologetically, unequivocally, always did and always will. Why that is, and why am I speaking about that? It's a spiritual retreat. We've retreated here to be away from the news. We've retreated here to be away from all these missiles that flying, right? Literally flying into, lived by people, by residents, areas, and the missiles that are flying in the social media right now, because we live in time of parallel wars. There's a war on the ground, and there is a war for the mind. We could argue that there has always been a war for the mind, ever since the concept of propaganda came into being. But it hopefully will become clear why am I speaking about this and why I say I stand with Palestinians very clearly so that I don't beat about the bush and I don't allow the possibility of somehow coming across politically correct, pleasing every camp, remaining neutral, remaining somehow in a safe territory of peace, 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 everyone is as guilty or nobody is guilty. It's only one consciousness. I'm absolved from all this. Somehow my heart tells me otherwise. So I'm not going to play these stinky games. And therefore I say again, I want to make it into a statement. If one needs one, I stand with Palestinians from the day one. I was conscious enough to know what is happening in this part of the world, period. We live in time of tremendous agitation, conflicts that are there on the planet in an interrupted fashion, certainly since this body came into manifestation. All my life, all my childhood, all my teenage years, all my young years, all, all the time there were wars, 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 wars. I grew up in wars. I've heard about Israeli-Palestinian conflict as a kid, as a teenager, 12-year-old, 18-year-old. I should have been immune by now, numb by that. Gotten used to it. It's just something there, an old wound. When things go on a bad day wrong, it begins to bleed. No. What I am happy to relate now as the get going of this discourse, as an unfolding, let's say, passages, is that awareness and consciousness is on the rise. What was possible to sweep under the rug, very weak, by the way, metaphor, what was possible to hide away, what was possible to manipulate, becomes more and more difficult. And this is a very difficult time because it's all looming into our faces. We no longer are in a position to hide anymore, no something to be hidden from us. And this is an extraordinary time we being alive. And this is exactly why I want to mix and match these messages of non-duality with living here and now, being human in this moment in time and what it takes. Because if someone thinks that there is some kind of a safe haven territory one can retreat into and one is cut off from all that what's happening in the world, one can remain, as it were, undisturbed in one's own peace lulled cozily in the cocoon of spiritual beliefs of brotherhoods and sisterhoods. No. The reality is by far more, by far more complex than that. 
the reality of the situation is that the God is no longer there to sort out our affairs. The reality of the situation is much more quantum, much more in terms of how we're going to square this. Have we grown up enough? Or we still consider to be in a state of adolescence where we will continue making these erroneous mistakes, errors, which cost more and more and more suffering to the entire human race and all the earthlings on this planet, including, of course, above all else, to those energies that are supposed to sustain us, to those frequencies that are supposed to sustain us, those spheres that our atmosphere envelops this beautiful place in space-time. All these frequencies, all these radiant beings, different realms of different angels and archangels. Because it's not a pleasing sight to see us in this phase of strive. When we can't even protect our children. When we are so divided, fundamentally, ideologically bankrupt, spiritually bankrupt. When we put forth religious ideas as a flag that justifies killing in the manner of machination, when it's mechanized, modernized. And why do I say I stand with Palestinians? Isn't this a fair share of affairs? Yes, of course it is. In my private message to the Sangha, as soon as the events since October 7th unfolded, to the team of 20 plus some people with whom we work on a daily basis as a flowing wakefulness organization, I've issued several messages. One of the first of these messages, as some of you here will, will testify, was that victim and perpetrator are locked. Didn't I say that? Right? Locked. In in separate manner. There is the connection there. There is something, even if karmically. But, that being said, with that being said, with that being acknowledged, our job is always stand with the oppressed. So this is to reassure no possibility of spiritual bypassing and doing harm deep down at the level of the heart if we want our heart to truly embody peace, equanimity and beatitude. This in a way is a code of Manu. This is the code of the solar dynasty beings who have established human civilization here millions of years ago. Millions of years. Because human being is not just human, it's being. This is where consciousness settles its affairs and nowhere else. It doesn't settle its affairs at the level of dolphins, monkeys, bears, spiders, ants or bees, although it's just as wonderful, as intricate and as fascinating. But here, where the human and being are infused to the degree when one can se cannot separate one from the other, is where the affairs settled. So our job is always to stand with those who are the weaker, the oppressed, thumped down mercilessly, brutally. And that's what happened to Palestinian people for 75 some years, repeatedly. Whilst the international community, because it is driven by self-righteous and heavily invested interests to create wounds on the planets, bleeding wounds where one can endlessly supply whatever that is being manufactured for the 
insatiable desire for mounting wealth for God knows what aims because one cannot drive two cars and one cannot really eat two meals unless one wants to puke. Things are simple, but we want to make them complicated. So political science is created. And all this is coming to the end. And we are witnessing that. Thus, I'm very happy to say that right now, as we started our program, just yesterday, the United Nations voted in extraordinary, unprecedented number of votes to have ceasefire now to stop the bombardment of Gaza now. I don't have the exact facts. I think it's 150, oh, forgive me if I'm wrong, of yes against a ridiculous minority of no's. And unfortunately, a lot of cowardly countries comprising the entire Central Europe withdrew from voting, abstained from voting. Shame on us, Central Europe. And I am really happy that Spain is among the countries and Portugal and France that unequivocally supported immediate ceasefire. These are all sciences that, are conscious, that consciousness is on the rise. Because it would not be possible only a few years ago. Because it's not nothing new in the bombardment of Gaza. Nothing new. Nothing new. It was bombed, suppressed on frequency of the pattern. You can freaking start coming up with fractals. And our job is always to be on the side of the weak. We cannot afford to be bystander. We can't take here the golden middle of Solomon's judgment. Because, as you know very well, when witnessing wrongdoing, when bear witness to the wrongdoing and remaining, as it were, unaffected and withdrawing oneself, abstaining from Ethical judgment contributes to the wrongdoing, period. It's a very simple algorithm. We contribute to the wrongdoing, we contribute to the darker forces, to negative forces, by mere fact of abstaining, by mere fact of simply being uninvolved bystander. So, this is to be taken as the entrance to today's discourse as we continue to speak about identity, sense of identity, to make it very clear that a lot more goes into what we speak of when we speak of identity. And it takes more to separate wheat from the chaff than just leapfrogging into Brahman and hoping that we have bypassed a tremendous territory of what it means to be alive today, what it means to share this space, share this being with everything. So the affair of being human is supreme. There, there's no doubt about it, but it's ridden with ups and downs. It's ridden with phases when something is being brought to the fore to such degree when we are challenged, challenged in our own skin, just sometimes to go through the day with dignity seems to be requiring unsurmountable amount of Courage, energy, patience, empathy, 
and dare I say, love. So, from that angle, this whole enterprise of spiritual realization is indeed, could be viewed, as has been pointed out repeatedly, now well into the third decade by the new Advaita and non-duality. That Everyone is perfect. There's nothing needs to be done. Seeking is a waste of time. Seeking itself is perpetuating the delay. And as you recall, we have gave our own stubborn, our own glossated that seeking indeed is a misunderstanding. It's a some kind of form of cultural mistranslation lost in translation, misappropriation maybe of what in perennial traditions meant when they spoke of a seeker, what comprises of someone who is on the path towards, let's say, the essence of who one is. From that point of view, this whole seeking is a waste of time indeed. A waste of time. A luxury of the middle class of developed countries. A luxury which many, many countries cannot afford. It's a luxury of being born into a certain economical zone. Yes, we could look at seeking from that point of view. It's a spectacular way of passing one's time because it fills one with incredible sense of purpose, self-importance, even if it's at the constant reminder to oneself of how one wishes to self-depreciate oneself, because that's what seeking also comprises of. To carve that ego, to watch one's everything, mind, desires, senses. So therefore, we felt it was very fitting to speak to the meaning of sadhana outside of these notions of seeking. And from get going, when I first went, ventured to speak publicly, when I felt well, there's no other way. Uh, you know, after all, let's not pretend I'm not a silent one who sits somewhere and squares a affairs of the world deep within that level. I didn't have it in me. I was meant to bring family and be in the hustle bustle of the marketplace. So that was asked of me and I did not have anything to say other than simply adhere. So therefore going publicly was only a natural thing to do. And from the very get going, it was very important for me to convey the message of that, what true sadhana comprises of, that there were times throughout the history of human civilizations that all these roles were assigned. That's by definition what Dharma prior to its violation. Every role and every enterprise has been assigned. Baker bakes the bread to the best of his ability. His predecessors did that, bake the bread in clay oven. It's an art, artistry. It's the highest science. Those of you who 
happened to watch Andrei Rublev, the masterpiece by Andrei Tarkovsky, Russian filmmaker of the Soviet Union era. You may remember that long entrance and then all that meanderings of that young boy who is with the task to bring into the action what he has learned with his mentor, his master, of how to cast a proper bell, because there's no one else left. It's a time of Mongol invasion. Everyone went into hide, hiding or has been taken captive. Only this boy. Anyone here remembers this film? No? Okay, good to know at least someone will start introducing some of the classics of human creativity into our curriculum before attending the emergence. Winking on the side, so something came to my eye. Yeah, he rolls in mad, there's this scene, like rain, and he looks for clay. It has to be the right type of clay to create a form, to cast a bell for a church, huge bell. It needs to have that, what the ancestors did, for hundreds of years, it needs to have consistency. And there's this point where he breaks down into tears that the freaking master left, died. He did not pass the secret. So the boy was bluffing all alone. He's a boy. He's like early 20s. He's crying there, having emotional breakdown all witnessed by the main character, Andrei Rublev himself, great painter, icon painter of the 15th century. His name was Andrei Rublev, who took the tradition of Byzantine icon painting, learned it from Theophanes the Greek, and kick-started its own icon painting school in Russia of the day. So Andrei Rublev is in Mona, speaking of Sanskrit. He is in the vow of silence because of committing an act of violence which he could not resist when he wanted to prevent a rape which he was a witness. And as a monk, he had no right. So he takes the axe, commits that crime, and then repents for many, many years because he imposes himself into the vow of silence. So the film is watched through the eyes of a silent painter. And there's this encounter when the boy rolls in mad in rain and cl collapses down that the master... Right? And of course, there's a great knyaz, you know, the prince commands everyone and the boy rises up. They all bring all those who were studying this craft. Church need to be rebuilt. We need the bell. Who can do it? You will do it because you had been studying with so-and-so. Go. If you don't, your head is out. Simple. The boy, of course, said, I will do it. And there is this nervous breakdown because the master never passed on the secret. So he bluffed his way through that he can do it, that he knows the secret. And in that moment when he is rolling in that mud, you see, he had this ecstatic moment because he finally found, found that clay somewhere in the area, digging everywhere like a dog. And guess the secret, the clay, when you take it into your hand and it's wet and squashed, it has to ring already. The earth needs to have sound. See, this kind of level of 
artistry and science, alchemy, has been passed from heart to heart in every domain of human enterprise. There are secrets in bread making that only kept in certain families. I grew up still, grew up still in old town of Tashkent in Uzbekistan, hearing namaz five times a day. This is my sound. This is deep at the level of vibrations. I have goosebumps as I speak. And we will boys run with a little pocket money to buy these freshly made breads from Tandir. Tandir, Tandori, there are related words. These words came from Central Asia into India, not the other way around. Tandir, clay oven, where women and men made this bread and brought, brought it wrapped all in blankets to sell. Same technology. No, we're queuing because that lady sells the best. What's the recipe? The same. Flour, water, sprinkle of sesame seeds on top into the oven. No, we're queuing for that lady and bread is sold in minutes. And we devour it without anything, without jam, butter or anything. No, no, it's delicious on the spot. It's a meal. It's the most satisfying. The violation of Dharma. This is what we live. And in the times when everyone does what they're meant to do, men rise out of bed, they know what to do. Women rise out of bed, they know what to do. Nobody locked in the petty games of sex agenda fights. Monks certainly rise knowing what to do. Every member of society acts their part as threads in this tapestry of that great Safavid mind-bending intricacy of the way the thread is being put together. It defies any imagination. The mathematical precision of the great mathematicians can be checked against that ancient Persian carpet. Everyone acts their part. Everyone. And that's what it means, Dharma. So there are people who always give their neurophysiology for that, for maintaining the balance. See? And then comes religion and massacres that, destroys that. You have to pay, pay either heavy taxes or cease to exist because you're carrying too frivolously the teachings of Christ. You're not freaking adhering to the, what we've decided in the councils of Nicaea. We wipe out the teachings of love because that's what Christ taught. Unapologetic path of the heart, religion of love in favor of centralization and of creating some kind of religious state. So this is where true violence are going rampant. All that what was contained, kept in respective realms of creation. Because this, this, is where we come closer now, retracing ourselves from this place to understand that indeed the forces of light and forces of darkness must coexist. There's no way out of it. Creation is made out of light and darkness. One complements the other. Everything is in a tipping point of balance. But one act is violated, is like a domino effect. It goes and creates the havoc everywhere and it begins to destroy the very fabric of life. And that's what we live through right now. 
the destruction of the fabric of life. And this is why awakenings go haywires everywhere, expect it or not. In times when Dharma is upheld and everything is intact, everyone knows what to do, not because they are indoctrinated into what they must do. No, because they act in accord with the inborn nature. And the inborn nature here is only, only in alignment with that what has been passed on. So, for those who have no longer place in society, they are eradicated, wiped out, and they held like a column. You remove one column, structure becomes already volatile, potentially. But when you start knocking off all the columns, when the roof goes down, one shouldn't be surprised. So this is also why spirituality today and spiritual work has nothing to do with personal affair of a kind of like digging the mask out of the belly button. I said that already, you're not a deer. Nothing of value will be extracted. We can't sell it to the perfume makers and grass, relax about it. So this is also why we gather like this. And there's no time. Like Maharishi Mahesh Yogi back in the days, yes, maybe one can begin to speculate, navigate one's own kind of like sense of righteousness. At some point he was pressed, he said, you know what, during this time, it's like a very quick crash course. Here is the rifle, okay? This is how you discharge and this is how you charge it. You aim there and you shoot here. Got it? Here we go. You are initiated. Next one. Next one. Next one. Because these are the times. So this is why we can't just sit and twiddle our thumb, you know, and take you into 12-year sadhana, and when you're ready, then we will work for peace. Or get lost in the meanderings of, you know, my traumas, my this, my that. No. We have to do it all on the go. Literally. On the go. No one is exempt. That's why I give, keep giving these examples, right? becoming almost like a joke within the Sangha. The magnificent seven ones. I'm not going to ask even if you know what I'm talking about. But we are going to Mexico to be again smack in the spot where the original was shot some years ago. Yes, that's where it was shot. Where the oasis is now. It was all cacti and prairie-like landscape. So that's where the Magnificent Seven was shot as first Hollywood production of the kind. With all the all greats cast. So great it inspired Kurosawa to make his own in Japan. In feudal Japan. To show wandering samurais without jobs anymore because the era of Edo is gone. A whole class of warriors honed to perfection to live in purpose and service of society made obsolete now. It's the most lamented, hated, misunderstood part in Japanese culture. So much wrote, spoken about. And that's how, what we, by large, how we know anything about Japan. Because it somehow entered collective consciousness, this. 
But the nobility of that script, the nobility of the idea that is portrayed, that these seven men are asked by villagers, by emissaries of that village that are about to be assaulted by gangsters, bandits. Yeah, gangsters. Men who have no scruples, no heart. It turned to rock, who just go everywhere, loot, take, rape, kill, for sport. But the guys have no stake at it. They don't even yet connect it. They only speak to two. And the guys take it on them and, you know, as their own. And they know they're going to die. All of them are going to die. And they are greatly outnumbered. They know they're going to die. But their job is to protect the villages. And they have to train the villages very quickly. This is a very simple plot. You see? The greatness of that film and each of its remakes all the way down to Denzel Washington's brilliant brilliantly played part where he plays what was played by Steve McQueen before is that it meant to touch those strings in the heart that even if you are That belongs to what my what I didn't finish the sentence. Even if you do not believe it's your job, even if you believe you are not capable to, when push comes to shove, it becomes a matter of making it or breaking it. It becomes a matter of survival. It becomes the matter of whether there is going to be another rite of passage. They could have just listened to the villagers and they offered them money. You know, we poor villagers like gathered everything they have to pay for the job. But they know they're going to die. What money can do? They know. There's no way. There's a, the bandits way outnumber. And they are only with the help of few elders, children, women, whom they all train on a spot to defend themselves, to create fortification, everything. And indeed, they all die. All of them without exception. But what a freaking glorious death. So this analogy is, in a way, is why we are faced with this unsurmountable amount of challenges collectively as a humankind. Because some portion of the humankind is turned into bandits, rocketeers, gangsters of war's sort. The forces of light and darkness that meant to be kept in balance were tipped. The violation of Dharma, of which Bhagavad Gita sings verse upon verse upon verse, brought this as a reminder. There's a whole chapter on the what, how, how that happens. Most of spiritual teachers today, of those you've mentioned last night, prefer to always go for Ashtavakra Gita, Ribu Gita. Always go there. But when Maharishi Mahesh Yogi asked of his preference between Brahma Sutras, which is another most authoritarian text on non-duality, and the Bhagavad Gita, he said, both are great non-dual scriptures, but I prefer the Bhagavad Gita because it offers more practical solutions to any being at any point in time. Because the, because the Bhagavad Gita does not cease from exploring and addressing all the states of consciousness as it goes through verse by verse by verse. 
starting from the despondency of Arjuna, even if to show the quality of Arjuna's heart. Whereas Brahma Sutra is all absolutely abstract knowledge. It goes straight to the core of the matter. You can't live by Brahma Sutras, but you can live by Bhagavad Gita. So that was the sage's response. Of the two, I prefer the later. So this, for us to have some, I would say, indispensable POV before we can return to a safety of that board where by doing these drawings we don't offend anyone, we don't upset anything, we don't ruffle any feathers. At the time that we live right now, when everything is violated to such degree, the worst thing of the kind spiritually inclined folk can do is to bypass it all. And least someone missed the crux of the matter is that it's not about taking to arms. It's not call to arms. I'm not Che Guevara here. It's not about taking this literally. It is given as most immediate, handy metaphor upon metaphor to what otherwise still requires tremendous courage of the heart. To witness all this, to have one's own preferably independent stand on what your heart is way with, what it is burdened with. Because the path of the heart is not a path of the life of the void. Far from it. The great Sufi here weeps for the affairs of the world. His heart bleeds all the time, weeps all the time for the pain, injustice, wiping the tears off. It polishes the heart again and again so that the light of awareness can reflect ever so brightly. So in that being, nothing can patch consciousness. It cannot. Because it is free of anything of that kind. It bounces the light freely off, reflects it off back into the world so as to lead all the crevices and pockets, so as to add that more light. At the infinite level, at the level of what we speak of here, at the level of that, how everything is interconnected, that shall suffice. So it's not a call to enter these polemics of who is right, who is wrong, who has started it. But to see this through the eyes of non-dual understanding and compassion and know where one stands, not to forgo any minute shades of what feelings and emotions may rise. Because that also part of the job. Everyone is a work in progress. None of us are here to be varnished as a finished work of art. Everyone here is something in the making. And that what gives the possibility for bringing this balance back in order. So it's not being against darkness. We can't be against darkness. We embody both. 
But we have to claim victory here and now within our own heart and maintain that balance. And maintain that balance. That's what sudden is. So it's nothing to do with you or me. It has nothing, to, never has been about me being enlightened. No, no one is even getting enlightened. No, that we can clearly agree with every, whatever one tradition of G and this G. We agree. Behind the scenes, we all agree. That there's no disagreement there. To simplify it, in this moment in time, we can't afford bypassing. So maybe the motivational force, driving force in the first place, somehow was driven by desire to end personal suffering for most of us in this day and age that's certainly what they say the Kali Yuga is known for for most some exceptions there some seek power over oneself over others hopefully over oneself first and foremost. And the rarest of them all who simply love divine for what it is, for no gain whatsoever. Nothing. In fact, it's a one-way affair, always. One-way affair. Nothing asked of God. Nothing asked of the divine. Ever. Man is constantly given oneself repeatedly if anything maybe somewhere I want to see you please show me your face prove prove me wrong but let that motivation that comes from personal inadequacy suffering discontent set this flame ablaze and turn you into the torch of light that ignites all those who come in contact into close enough proximity to get that spark passed on, ignited. <laughs>